All right, uh, we'll go Bobcats uh, next week in Cleveland and go Bobcats tonight up here, uh, up the road in uh, Oxford. Um, a, a couple of guys here in the chat saying that uh, Craig is big league. They call you the Sandman. And one of the, the, the things that I used to have a lot of fun with a number of our uh, 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 regular watchers is buying the hype. They would always get on my case about not buying the hype. You know where I'm coming from here. Um, with the Reds, you're buying the hype. Am I right or wrong, or, or are those guys wrong? I am buying the hype. And uh, one of the things that's been interesting to see is the mixture of people in the media who are buying the hype or the complete opposite. Um, you know, we saw recently uh, with Talking Baseball who weren't necessarily all in on the Reds. Um, one of the things that I saw yesterday with the MLB, the show releasing their player rankings, I mean, I think Matt McClain was the highest rated player and he was an 84. So I'm not really sure that everybody's buying the hype. I'm extremely excited about the potential for this team. It's nice to see some of the offensive pieces come together recently for sure. Uh, obviously, the pitchers are working on spring training things as they should be. So um, I'm still all in on the hype. I know there's some people out there talking about stats that maybe aren't going the way they wanted. Um, but at the end of the day, people like Hunter Green and some of the other uh, pitchers right now are not focusing on pitching the way they will be in the season. They're focused right now on working on adding to their repertoire, perfecting the pitches that they're working on. And so I'm not worried like some of the people are about uh, the quote unquote paper and the production that they're seeing right now. But I'm all in. I think this team can can very easily win uh, 85, 86 games, but I honestly wouldn't be shocked to see them push in 90, 92. Really? I'm all in. Now, obviously, as we talk about on the show, every week it seems like health is going to play a huge factor yep. in this, yep. right? You've seen a lot of depth on the mound from this team, and the pitchers that they're expecting depth from for this season – are throwing very well this spring. Offensively, I'm not so sold on the depth uh, across the infield um, specifically. I think they have a number of pieces who can plug in, um, but I'm not as sold on the depth there. So a couple injuries offensively could really derail them, uh, but I'm very excited about the depth that they've shown, especially on the mound. Um, and I think that there's some pieces hopefully offensively, that can step up. Tyler Stevenson over the last week or so has finally shown a little bit of life there in yeah. Arizona. Um, and if he can get things going, then that's going to be a huge piece for this team. You know, the, the, the thing I always get back to, Craig, is this. Um, and, and what concerns me, uh, I, I believe very much there is such a thing as a sophomore slump. It's not so much that it's a sophomore slump. It's more that guys have a better idea on the mound of how to attack a young hitter. Uh, and, and that's why you see guys like Ellie De La Cruz trying to make significant changes in their approach at the plate and so on and so forth. So that battle will go on all year long. But I'm with you. I, I think that when I look at Strand, I look at McLean, I look at De La Cruz, I look at Marte, I look at Steer. I think these – Friedel. I think these guys are more than capable of making the proper adjustments because they're very talented players. Here, here's my concern, okay? And I really put very little stock in spring training. I, I think if – if you were to go back and look at the last 10 years in Florida and Arizona, who were the top five hitters during spring training and the top five pitchers during spring training, most of the names you and I wouldn't even know. You might know. I wouldn't know. Okay? So I don't put a lot of stock in that. But you do want to see guys do well. You want to see Ellie. He's showing he's going to get on base. On and on and on. My concern is this. If the Reds are buying into the old theory, and really this, this was a situation that was created many, many years ago about the number of innings that a pitcher will make from one season to the next, okay? And generally that's been regarded. You'd like to see them step up 10 to 15% from where they were the year before. They don't have a single guy in a starting rotation. And I know you talk about the depth, but they don't have a guy in this starting rotation that as we enter this season would be a guy that is going to be capable of pitching, starting and pitching 32 to 33 to 34 games 
And giving you five or six in, in this day and age, seven might be a stretch, but five or six innings. And, and so I say to myself, okay, it's great to have that depth. But now if you're bringing up guys that have been trip, AAA pitchers all year long in August and September when you need the games the most, with that in mind, do, do you think that David Bell is going to manage differently early in the season to navigate and limit those innings? Well, you're certainly going to see a lot of, of management from David Bell on that. I mean, there's a reason they went out and got Nick Martinez with his flexibility and ability to come in and start. The difference where, for me personally this year versus last year specifically is that because of last year and having to bring up a lot of those arms, you're now bringing up AAA guys who have experience in the big leagues, right? Yep. So you're not bringing them up, asking them to throw their first ever professional big league innings in September and August when you need them most, right? We look at guys like Connor Phillips, who a lot of people are high on and was forced into situations last year who quite frankly, probably wasn't ready. Same thing with guys like Lyon Richardson, right? So now you've got an opportunity with with not only the starting pitching hopefully being healthy, but you're going to have a guy like Brandon Williamson potentially, um, Abbott potentially, who are going to be starting at AAA this year and available for, for call-up when needed versus in the past where you were relying on guys who started the season at single-A ball. Yeah. So that's the big difference for me is, yes, I 100% agree with you that if you're having to call up AAA arms when it matters most, that you could be in trouble. But when you're calling up major league arms that you've been stashing in AAA, that's a different story to me. All right. Um, you know, I, I, sort of the case in point is last night. And again, I don't put any stock into maybe – because uh, I, I don't know exactly what guys might be working on, right? But, but Hunter Green is on the record as saying that he wants to be more pitch efficient. Well, you know, this was like when I was broadcasting the Diamondbacks games, and I saw Randy Johnson for five years, and he won the Cy Young Award every single year. Well, they weren't putting pitch limits on Randy Johnson. I mean, if you go back and look at his starts, start by start, Every single start over a regular season. There is rarely ever a game he's not going seven. Most he's going eight and nine. And he's striking out anywhere from 12 to 14 to 15 to as many as 20 batters. So when you strike out a lot of guys, right, you're going to have high pitch counts. Johnson didn't walk many guys. Now, he did when he was a younger man, Hunter Green's age. Um, but, you know, last night, three innings. He only gives up two hits. He punches out five, but he walks three. He gives up the two runs. That you know, I, I've got to see a better step in the efficiency direction. No, and I would agree with that, but I think we would also agree that Hunter Green is specifically working on adding pitches to the repertoire yes. this spring. Yes. And so I, I I'll, full transparency, I didn't get a chance to watch the full game last night, so I have not watched Hunter Green's outing yet. Um, certainly look forward to trying to find that and and, and watching it and seeing what were the pitches he was missing on? Um, you know, obviously he gave up the two hits that you talked about, but what was this pitch mix like? Um, before I do that, I don't want to speculate too much on what was happening, but at the end of the day, this is what spring training is for. I don't think anybody's expecting these guys to come out there and throw nine shutout innings over the right. course of the spring. Uh, the, but this is the first opportunity for Hunter Green really to be working hand in hand with DJ in order to be working on these pitches and getting them ready for the regular season. So, um, again, you know, we talked about not putting a whole lot of stock into the spring training. Um, Hunter Green's one of those people that, from my perspective, and again, I'll watch it when I can, um, I want to see progress from him. I don't necessarily care too much about the results right now. Mm -hmm. um, but if he can't throw all those pitches for strikes come April – then I'll certainly start to get concerned and, what, and question whether or not it should be part of the repertoire right now. All right, let me ask you a question, because I've heard a lot of debate about this, and, and I'm curious. Will Benson or Christian Encarnacion Strand? Now, McLean, De La Cruz, Steer, rightfully so. They get most of the pub. Marte, to a lesser extent, because they're all so young. Well, Encarnacion Strand is young, too, and Benson is young. Um, 
I would make the argument that I think those two have the potential to be the two best offensive players on this team this year. A lot of people would scream at me and say, that's ridiculous with De La Cruz. You think I'm out on a limb there or no? Well, I think it depends on what you consider the best offensive players, right? I think there's, without a doubt, a question for them to be extremely successful and be contributing to this team. I think when you talk about overall contributions, offensively specifically, and you look at what guys like Ellie is able to do on the base pass, creating havoc, which sure. is something that the Reds preach, I think there's an opportunity there for him to contribute beyond just at the plate. Um, so if Ellie can get on base, then there's certainly going to be an opportunity for him to affect the game every single time. And what we've seen this spring is an opportunity for him to really work the count, get on base. He's not necessarily swinging the, for the fences. Um, and we talked about this in our Zips uh, projection review. Um, but for Ellie, he's been working all offseason on kind of compacting that swing, making mm. it a little bit quieter before the pitch. Um, and so... I think there's an opportunity if he can change his approach to have a significant increase this year in his offensive production um, and therefore translate that on the base pass, scoring runs, stealing bases, etc. Now, Christian Encarnacion Strand specifically has unmatched power on no this doubt team, and I think it. we've seen that this spring. Um, the question is going to be, can he continue to adjust to major league pitching as they adjust to him? And we saw it with Ellie last year when he first came up. He was red hot for the first month, and then pitchers adjusted to him. And so for the next month or so, he was ice cold. And CES is going to have to go through that same sort of transition. Now, I don't think CES's approach to the plate is going to provide as many issues as it did for Ellie. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that he's going to have an adjustment period, probably in the May time period. Uh, where pitchers are adjusting a little bit more based on scouting reports and what they're seeing. Um, but him and Benson have both shown an extreme ability to get it done at the plate. Um, one of the things that I've actually really liked from Will this year is he is clearly asking for more at-bats against left-handed pitching. He has complete faith in himself. And so much of this game, a lot of times, is that confidence piece. And there's no question that Will Benson has confidence yeah I think this time a year ago you know he was that former number one pick from Cleveland that, that it just didn't work out for him for you know multiple reasons and that happens to a lot of guys I mean whether they're number one pick or 27th round pick um, but you're of course under the spotlight more when you're a number one pick the Reds decide to give him a flyer he comes up he literally couldn't find his tail with both hands uh, for <laughs> about three weeks and then they sent him down to the minor leagues and you know he gets his act together and I think that that's where See, I like seeing guys in all walks of life here, Craig. I, you know, I want to see guys and what they do when they fail. When you're a number one pick, there's a really good chance that you have never failed at anything in baseball, if you're Will Benson, okay? You probably cruise through Little League, through junior high, through high school, if you go to college, and you are just one of the best, if not the best player on the field every time you run out there no matter who you're playing against. Now, all of a sudden, you know, you're getting into professional baseball and these things happen. I love seeing the guy who's been tested, really tested, their confidence, wondering, am I good enough? And he's openly talked about this thing. Should I even play anymore? This ain't going anywhere. That's the kind of guy I look at and I say, man, they've shown me something already. You know what well, I this mean? is a game of streaks. It's a game of streaks, right? I mean, we're talking about a sport where a 30% success rate gets you in the Hall of Fame, right? So if you have that confidence to bounce back from those cold streaks, then you're going to be extremely successful, right? So it's all about how you bounce back. It's all about how you adjust. I mean, Joey Votto, over his course of his career, has talked about it plenty, about how pitchers adjust to him, and so his job is to adjust back to the pitcher, right? So, um, yeah, I love seeing it. How many number one picks have we seen either never make it to the big leagues at all or make it to the big leagues and within a month they fizzle out and we never really hear from them again. So Will Benson's story is not unique um, in the world of baseball, quite frankly, uh, but he has shown over the course of the last 12 months or so, 
well, maybe even less, um, significantly less, actually, now yeah, that you really yeah. think about it. But um, the ability to bounce back. And it feels like his confidence is back. It feels like um, he is ready to really impact this team. And he's trying to be the everyday right fielder. Um, whether or not that's going to happen with the platoon, uh, we'll see. Uh, but it's nice to know that in today's game where pitchers are only going to go somewhere between four and six innings most of the time, but you're not going to have to immediately pinch hit for him in the sixth inning and burn a pinch hitter and then have to uh, substitute every other inning in order to accommodate uh, pitching. Well, I'm so. still betting the ranch that David Bell is going to do that, but we'll see how that <laughs> The last thing I want to ask you about is um, – I have never understood, and believe me, I'm a guy who can be as critical as anybody around. These are professional athletes. When they do good, you talk about them doing good. When they don't do well, you talk about them not doing well. They're getting paid to produce. It's about execution and production. And if you don't do it, go home. Just get out. And if you're sensitive to it, get out. I have never understood all of the vitriol that comes Jonathan India's way. Is he a perfect player? No, he is not. There is no question about that. He won the Rookie of the Year. He comes back the next year, was banged up, you know, didn't play all that great. And then last year he played the entire season, uh, probably every single day, he was checking his phone with friends, family, whatever it might be. Hey, are you going to get traded? Are you going to get traded? Are you going to get traded? He's gone through the same thing now in the winter. Okay, he's been battling this plantar fasciitis thing, and I've said it myself. I had plantar fasciitis for 10 years, and it was brutal. And the only thing that the only thing that worked, which he has not done, and for the life of me, I just can't understand it because it's the same group of doctors that, that treated mine that treated his. And that's where you get PRP. They take the plasma, take the blood out of your arm, they numb up your leg, and they shoot the plasma back inside of the areas that are torn in the plantar fascia around the heel. It, it, it's, a, it's a process. It takes a while, but thank God above for me anyway, it worked. He didn't do this. Um, but why do you think there is so much negative directed at Jonathan India? He seems like a great guy. I don't know him. He seems like a good dude, right? He's a new father. He's always upbeat. People talk about him being a leader. If people want to say, hey, I think we should trade him because it makes us better and it doesn't take away at bats from A, B, C, and D, fine. But it seems like everybody throws in the, the hate behind it. Yeah, I, I don't necessarily understand the hate completely. I understand the frustration defensively out of Jonathan India, sure. which is one thing. And certainly that's something that he knows he has to work on. Um, the thing for me this year that I'm excited to see is, and we talked about this again on, on Chatterbox Reds with, with Nick Kirby. Um, for me personally, the one benefit of platoons and of the way David Bell manages is that he's putting his players in the best position to be successful. And I don't believe that Jonathan India has necessarily been treated as someone who needs to be put in the right position to succeed moving forward. And so he's been an everyday second baseman for the last two years, um, but he really has struggled against right-handed pitching. And so... In the new system where not only do we have additional depth in the infield, but the work that he's putting in in the outfield, there's going to be an opportunity to really treat him, I said this comparison over the summer, more similar to a Nick Senzel, where he absolutely rakes against left-handed pitching. He maybe struggles against right-handed pitching. And so I know a lot of people don't like the platooning that David Bell does sometimes, but ultimately, when we just got done talking about confidence and getting people's confidence up, one of the things that David Bell and the Reds organization is going to do with Jonathan India, obviously, it starts by just keeping him. I think that says a lot to him as a player that they chose to keep him despite the opportunity to move him, is they're going to put him in positions to succeed. And then as he continues to succeed, then they can work in additional at-bats against right-handed pitching and otherwise where maybe it's a more challenging situation, but it allows him to take that confidence he gains against left-handed pitching and parlay that into success against right-handed pitching. Fair enough. Craig, we can't thank you enough for your time here today, my friend. We'll check in again with you sometime soon, and I hope you have a great weekend. 
You got it. Tom, I think Trace is watching. I think I saw a tweet that the guys are watching. So here's my question. Trace loves the conversation about go-to road trip snacks. So I'll ask you, what's your go-to road trip snack? A cup of coffee. That's my road trip snack. Coffee. I just stop time after time and just keep pounding the coffee and keep rolling. I've done a lot of driving <laughs> in my life. I love driving. I'm one of those guys, jump in a car, drive to Arizona, whatever. Uh, you, you like driving? And what's your go-to snack? Uh, yeah, so I'm the driver in the family. Anytime we drive anywhere, I'm the one behind the wheel, whether the drive is 10 hours or two hours, uh, it's me. Uh, I'm more of a sweets guy, so okay. uh, I go for the Twizzler nibs, not All the right. full Twizzlers, just the nibs. You could pop them in just like sunflower seeds. They're a good go-to for me, so I, I enjoy those. All righty, my man. Nice to see you. Have a great weekend, Craig. All right, Tom. We'll talk to you later.